Welcome on to Searching for Mana, David. Thank you very much for having me. Great to be here. Pleasure. Been um, looking forward to recording this episode. Uh, fuller introduction, uh, our guest today is David Keane, Chief Marketing Officer at or with Funding Options. Um, I suppose the headline uh, piece that I'm curious to get started with is you are a ex-Googler. Mm -hmm. um, about a year ago, you took the move, broadly speaking, from big tech into fintech. I did indeed. So if we could have some type of macro view why, why you made that move. Okay. Um, let's maybe think about this more from a career development perspective and maybe some philosophy around career development. I think there are two fundamental types of careers. Careers that you would categorize as I-shaped careers, so where you go as senior as you can, as very deep as you can of one particular discipline. You know, if brain surgeon is your thing, that's you. You're an I-shaped person. The other type, which is what I would subscribe to, would be a more T-shaped structure, where you look at building disciplines in different parts of the business, and growing yourself and growing your connections and being able to put un unique and different things together. So my personal development plan and coaching plan is to always keep learning, to keep growing, to keep moving across to new things that you can learn and attach. And I've been at Google for some seven years, done three amazing roles. Google is just a stunning company to work for, amazing people, some of the best people you'll ever see. But still, it's a really, really large company. It's a really large global company. And I wanted that experience of working for a small organization that would have difficulties, where there would be crises, where you had to really drive and own it, and where you didn't get amazing food and a massage every day, <laughs> where you had like a coffee machine and some fruit in the morning, if you were lucky. Um, and that's why I made the change. I very consciously made the change to learn some different skills, grow some new muscles. And my background has always been scaling up inside large corporates. So, you know, not necessarily um, entrepreneurship, but more intrapreneurship inside businesses. I wanted to really take those skills I'd learned and apply them without a safety net. Okay. And some of the things I picked on, on there are relatively masochistic. So you wanted to, <laughs> you wanted to move into FinTech because of the struggle and the challenge. Um, I don't know that's part of it, of course I'm joking. But what, what was, um, other than you mentioned there, that because it's smaller, you have more influence perhaps on, on the show. What were some of the other things that you had to consider? You're moving away from, um, a, a, as you said, let's forget the brilliant massages and awesome cafeterias and, yeah. and, and much more stuff. You know, you know that you're working with some of the best people in the world. Yeah. The projects truly shape and affect um, what's going on in the world. Yeah. So it's intellectually stimulating. Um, financially, I'm sure the rewards are, are, are there. Absolutely. Uh, et cetera. So what were some of the things that perhaps you, you had reservations about with the move? I think in any career move, you always have reservations. You think deeply about what you're going to do. I'm sure many of the listeners out there today are thinking about what do they do in 2020? Should they carry on doing the same thing? Um, or should they make a change? To me, it's all about, you know in your stomach when it's time to make a change. You know when you're not learning as much as you were. Now, despite Google being full of the best people, doing like amazing earth shattering projects, etc. Once you've been there for a certain period of time, you learn less. And for me, this is all about constant lifelong learning, growing as you do, you know, where am I gonna find that experience of being able to do stuff I've not done before? So to me, it was all about, yeah, I'm happy to jettison all of those positive things that are there because I'm gonna get this thing that makes me happy, that kind of makes me wake up early with a big smile on my face get in there and get going because I'm learning something new. So choosing a smaller environment mm -hmm. um, affords that, but why out of the different um, emerging sectors mm -hmm. such as uh, health tech um, and then fintech, yeah. did you land in fintech? So my background is B2B SaaS innovation, so cloud, 
and different SaaS solutions. So in the past, I've worked for Salesforce, SAP, and Oracle, as well as Google. Um, so you could say you cut me down the middle, it says B2B big tech, yeah. like proper B2B big tech. Um, I was looking at some startups in the B2B SaaS space, and there's some really interesting players out there today. And I very, very nearly joined one of those. There's some really, really interesting health techs out there. Sadly, I'm not a medical doctor, and I don't have a PhD in any kind of biomed field. So, you know, that kind of pushed me away from one of those sort of businesses. Um, I have a background in fintech, so when I first came into the world of work, I worked in an insurance company, and then I worked for American Express and Barclay Card and a number of other very large financial companies. So I've got some of that DNA already. I understand how those worlds work. Um, there's a lot of really interesting early innovation in fintech right now. London is amazing for fintech. You know, if you're looking for, for a very fast growth space and you live in London, fintech is probably one of the very, very obvious startup spaces and scale up spaces there. Yeah. So that's really, that was the driver. It was about availability um, and it was about the new. So there's a lot of B2B SaaS businesses. I've done a lot of that. I wanted to kind of break into something slightly different and challenge myself in a different way. Which ended up with you taking the CMO role at, at funding options. Funding options. Yep. Um, you landed that role nine, ten months ago or so. So I started at the beginning of July, yeah. Yep. So like I'm almost six months today. And how's that been? It's been great. It's been a vertical learning curve. So when you're running large marketing organizations in big tech companies, you know, the way that you plan for the year, the way you manage your budget, the way that you do your marketing, planning, you know, agreeing your OKRs and your KPIs, doing all of that work is fairly formulaic and consistent across the different big tech companies that are out there. You come to a smaller organization, it's a completely different world, absolutely different world. Um, you know, day in, day out, you're being exposed to the macroeconomic changes that are going on. Clearly, we had some political challenges during, during the tail end of the year which kind of had very, very visible effects. The data that we were seeing going through, you know, literally we could see the political climate impacting what was happening out there in the market that we, that we address. You have to hire people, you have to hire great people, you have to convince them to come with you on this journey and that your mission's a really great one to do. And at Funding Options, we're essentially a search engine for business services. And we specialize in lending now, but we're growing out to other parallel services a little bit like maybe a money supermarket, but for B2B. Okay. Um, and are you in a position where you feel that gives you a USP, which of course helps when you're trying to attract the best talent and they have, as you rightly say in London, a plethora of super awesome yeah, options. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in B2C, the category of comparison for different financial and insurance and other products very, very well established. There's a ton of big players out there. In the in the beta, sorry, in the B2C space, it's very well established. In the B2B space, it's not established at all. Um, here in Europe specifically, in the US there's more, but in Europe, very, very little of that in place. So we've got the opportunity to do category creation here, cross market, cross jurisdiction, cross language, and really tackle that, you know, multi multi cultural multi-behavioural environment. We're currently in the UK and the Netherlands. Um, our big backer and investor is ING's venture capital fund out of the Netherlands. So we're building out across Europe with these different services to try and actually tackle how do we, how do we go cross geography, cross, cross national boundary, cross regulation with different business services to deliver that efficiency. Okay, and if we think about where the business is, in terms of numbers right now, there yeah. would be some broad numbers in terms of uh, customers, uh, revenues, what do you think the runway to profit is, etc. So all of that stuff is stuff that we're gonna be releasing at the end of January. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put that out to you today. Um, our growth is really strong. We've come through that difficult period in the tail end of the year this year. And, and, and when you say growth, on what criteria are you classing growth? So if we look at our growth, we're, we're growing at above 20% quarter on quarter right now. That's amazing. So yeah, the growth is fantastic. Um, very happy customers, 
great trust pilot scores. These are all things that you can see externally. Um, we're going to be releasing more numbers as we go towards the end of the month. Um, but yeah, we're really happy about where we are. We're happy about the opportunity. Because you've come into 2020 now, you have um, had a good experience in mm -hmm. 2019. You feel like, okay, this is the company that you know my next mission yeah. is in. And how are you thinking through as the CMO with leadership or the rest of the business, how are you going to structure a successful 2020? So we're in the process right now of putting in place our OKRs for the organization. Okay. And if I look at the journey that this team has been on, it was very much a startup and went through the difficult kind of startup journey that most businesses go through. During 2019, new leadership came in, including yeah. myself, and we put in place really what I would categorize as a scale-up plan and a scale-up approach with different processes, different ways of working, different ways of bringing that growth in. So this really is our first year as a full scale up. So you know we're putting in place the organizational OKRs. We've got a, an organizational kickoff next Thursday. Not like Google's amazing kickoffs in Las Vegas. You know we're going to be in the old Truman Brewery. It's not quite as glamorous, but uh, cool. we're going to have fun. Yeah. Um, and how many of you are there at the moment? So we're eighty four right now. Okay. So it'll be a party. Yeah, so we'll have a party, we'll have a little <laughs> bit of fun, but, but that's about bringing the people with you. And one of the key things once you reach that scale-up phase is how do you build culture? How do you create an amazing culture in an organization that you know, is revenue-driven and is driven by you know, limited resources, limited people? You know, things are always a little bit tight, but how do you create a fabulous culture, a fun place to work, a place that people choose to come to and that they recommend to their friends. Um, and a place where you have like respect and diversity and like a wide variety of opinions get shared in there. So we focus very much on building that culture, creating that environment. It's really, really working for us. And at that um, meeting, is there going to be an announcement of what you and the exec team are trying to achieve in 2020? So the way I tend to do objectives and key results, OKRs, is as a leadership team, you work through your North Star. You work through what are the key things that we're looking at. We're looking at you know, growth. How do we grow our presence online? How do we grow traffic? How do we grow traffic and customer acquisition profitably? How do we address both paid, display, organic, how do we do our SEO effectively, etc.? How do we look at then repeat customer business? How do we, how do we really address that whole digital space? And then, that's all at the executive level with with the revenue stuff that's coming through. And then each of the teams are working on their own OKRs. You know, one of the biggest errors that people make is they try and make these things top down. They say, okay, the exec team have defined their OKRs. Now you need to cascade these. That's not how OKRs work. Everybody builds them based on what they know. You then have a calibration process where you work collaboratively in a very flat structure and you start to synthesize between those layers so that you understand, you know, are these things even possible? Are we doing the right things in engineering given the aspirations that we've got here for revenue or for customer acquisition or for traffic to our website or whatever it, it may happen to be. Yeah. So it's about that process of setting a North Star, clearly describing those aspirational OKRs at each level of the organization, not in a cascading way. Getting people to recognize that business as usual is outside of that and there's a bunch of stuff that has to be done regardless. Yeah. And then starting to put the processes in place to make that happen. And those those processes to me are so, so key. And if you, know, if you don't use a process like OKRs, I would really encourage anybody listening to this to investigate it, read up on it. There's tons online. And um, you mentioned your North Star, hmm. which is perhaps similar to our searching for mana. Indeed. Um, <laughs> What is that then? Is that um, saying, look, we're going to do a bunch of things that should get us to this, but mm. you will have to find yours and as a group it is for you, what, is it one thing or is it many things? It's multiple things. Right. So we've set ourselves multiple things that we're going after. You know, if you look at the fintech market today, the fintech market is largely about improving the ability to do things that you can already do. I can already get a loan, 
Okay, so there's lots of businesses making it more efficient to get a loan, cheaper to get a loan, a better rate. I can already buy something on a credit card. And when I get a Monzo card, an account, or a Revolut card, etc., you know, I'm pretty much doing the same things, but in a more efficient way. We're trying to focus on how do we do things differently. And the story I'd tell on this would be, it's kind of, uh, if we go back to try and take some trends and parallels from, let's say chess, as a weird thing to, to think about. So in the kind of 70s, we had the whole thing of AI coming into computers. Big Blue playing Gary Kasparov. Gary Kasparov very famously lost. Okay, that's all good. So what happened after that? Grandmasters tried to play computers and beat them. And there was a lot of energy and effort put into how do people beat machines? How does the people stop AI taking over their jobs? So the Grandmaster chess players tried to do that. They lost. The interesting thing that happened after, after that that never gets talked about is what happened to grandmasters and chess players and computers. So grandmasters then started to team up with computers. So now you get chess matches of people and machines playing people and machines. And this, it's known as freestyle chess or, or, or cyborg chess, is at such a different level, machines lose to people and machines. Yeah. People lose to machines. So how do we move forward in business? How do we move forward in tech? How do we move forward in fintech? We move forward by people and machines working together in a smart way. So historically in fintech, you'd have a brokerage that would you know, have fairly clunky systems that would allow you to you know, maybe find a product that you wanted. Fantastic, and you could talk to a person. We then pivoted over and said, like, everything's digital. Let's just go 100% digital. No people, that's all fantastic. Super cheap, we can have great margins on this. It's gonna be very, very effective. But actually, we still want to talk to people. The next wave of fintechs is gonna be about people and machines giving services that we didn't even think about before and really taking it up to that kind of fintech 2.0 level and starting to put in place some very, very interesting, new and novel ways. And that's what we're focusing on. That's our North Star. It's that there's two things there. One is the hybridization of FinTech, where you've got people who are managing very, very effectively large books, large sets of, of business. And then you've got this whole idea of kind of business to business marketplaces, which are very, very underexploited today. So if you were giving um, advice to any listeners who are looking to have a career perhaps in fintech. Yeah. What would be the key skills over the next several years that you see this computers and humans uh, teaming up to be more mm -hmm. efficient in the space and actually create true innovation? Yeah. What would the makeup of those skills be that they should be looking at either upskilling, getting an education in? Mm -hmm. So there's a range of skills there, clearly programming skills, data is going to be very, very key to this, but also left brain and right brain balance. So, you know, when we hire people, we're not looking for people who are just very, very data driven. And we're not looking for people who are very, very creative. We're looking for people who are both creative and data driven. So that really is the magic combination. Can you bring people in who love data, who are really analytical and who are incredibly creative and can solve problems? They're the people that you want to bring in. And if you go back to kind of, you know, what do you learn working for Google? You learn that actually the people there, the Google hiring method is all focused on looking at kind of four key areas. The first is creativity. Can you problem solve? Can you actually do unique things and come to unique conclusions? The second is, are you data driven? The third is, do you have role related knowledge for the thing you want to do? You know, if you're working in marketing or in engineering or in you know, finance, that you've got those right skills. And then the final one is, are you a leader? And everyone has to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Not a manager, but can you lead projects? Because if you're gonna have a large flat organization with these kind of smart creatives who are both data-driven and creative working together, you've got these projects that form together you then have a squad that works around them. The people in that squad don't report to you. There's gonna be a leader in that squad. There's gonna be people leading those functions and those functions will then break apart. So this traditional idea of a large hierarchical structure with one person at the top 
where that person knows everything and can call all the shots, that's dead, that's dying. And it's very interesting coming from big tech into fintech, it's amazing how much of that old world, that old legacy world of hierarchy and structure, not, not at funding options and not in the smaller fintechs, but certainly in the larger financial organizations, it's all still in there, that structure is all in there, they're all still working in that way, and that's their biggest weakness right now. Yeah, I think that that could be in part because finance has had to um, hire in a number of people who can get regulations through, who mm. understand compliance, and this is something that you can't, um, like in the technology business, come into without domain knowledge, but where you have a real uh, engineering or programming mm. skill set. So the cultures are different. So mm. that's absolutely something that we experience in fintech as well as um, that you are getting innovative, technical, creative individuals, but you also typically have a senior exec team who have been in banking for 30 mm. or 40 years. Some companies are getting it right, others might not be. But what we do as a headhunting business to try and understand if um, individuals are able to lead where there's a flat structure is test if the individual is um, more typically directive or an influencer. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's something that you are now helping funding options get right. Perhaps you did at Google or any of the other big tech companies you're at. Because um, that seems to be the skill. If you can understand that you need to work with the team for the best outcome, but to influence it mm -hmm. might uh, get an outcome quicker and better, then people will take that opportunity, I assume, it, yeah. who's, who's Google or you're looking for yeah. funding options. Absolutely. And you know, if I look at how I lead the organization, my view is that I'm a coach and a servant leader. So I'm not on the field scoring goals. I've got an amazing team of people, you know, hired to, hired to a very high bar, high bar. My job then is to actually coach those people and to hold them accountable to own their plan and to lead their function. So, you know, my head of performance marketing owns the performance marketing plan, has all that stuff in there. We sit down once a week, we go through this, we have, have other touch points, but she's driving that. She owns it. She's pulling together the other stakeholders. She's leading that function. So she's leading that function without the authority to command people. So she's influencing to get things done, as you rightly say. But equally, I'm influencing, and I'm influencing through coaching. I'm not influencing through command. So I'm influencing through coaching, goal setting, working with them around their OKRs, you know, looking at, hey, you know, what are the work streams that you're working on right now? Do these work streams challenge you? You know, if you can do all the work streams that are in your OKRs effectively, then you're in the wrong role. You've got to have something you can't do in there. That's one of my rules. Um, so my job is a coach. My job is to develop those people and grow them and then give them some air cover and act at the executive level with the board, with the other leadership team members to remove, remove friction, to help set vision and direction at that macro level and then to enable people to run fast and come to their own conclusions below. And those people below as well, you know, it's about growing their capabilities and their understanding that success in their career is not about can you have a team of people you manage? It's about can you have projects that make a difference? Can you deliver? Can you project plan? Can you bring t people together? Can you get them excited and have a strong vision? In a um, company of funding option size around 80 people, mm. do you find that everybody being present is more productive? Because you describe yourself there as, as, as you know, a coach. Yep. Um, we have a culture at the moment where people like to work remotely, perhaps there's yeah. different um, geographies that people are based in. Um, you know, I certainly know if you're at Google, it's something like 40% of the time you aren't going to be in a meeting with someone in a room, right? This Correct. is going to be on Skype or, or yeah. Zoom. But in a startup, it's different. You want to have a culture. Mm -hmm. How is that at funding options? Are you able to work remotely in different yeah. geographies? People are able to work remotely. So we use Google's G Suite. We use Hangouts. Yep. Um, all of our rooms are equipped with Google's technology. 
So it's just as easy to have someone up on the screen on the wall as it is to be in sat there in the office. Yep. So my view on this is it's not my job as a leader to manage your calendar. You manage your calendar. You know, if you want to work at home for whatever reason, work at home. You know, if you need not to be here, you're not there. We don't man we don't work hours. We work projects. So you know, if you go to business school and you get a particular project that you've got to do in a syndicate group and you come together around it and I'm the professor and I've set the project, I don't check whether you're at your desk each day. I then mark the project and I give you coaching along the way at particular waypoints. That's how business is evolving. Is it important to have a location where people can come and meet in person? Yes, it is. And our expectation and the culture we create is that actually you, you know, you're not 100% remote and you're not 100% in the office, so that you can actually judge what's right for you, your personal circumstances. We want a diverse group of people to work there with diverse ideas and opinions. So therefore, just having people who can be in one physical place at one time in the day kind of shoots you in the foot there. So, it's, so yeah, it's, it's very much about the balance. <laughs> it's people and tech. It's about accountability. It's about holding people accountable for outcomes not hours worked, not how many emails did you send today. That's not going to fix anything in the world. You know, we should be looking at like, what did you achieve today? And if you achieve that in five hours, great. If you achieve that in 10 hours, you know, you're probably struggling a little bit. Do you, um, do you have uh, personally productivity hacks to make you as productive in any given day so that you achieve on your project? Yeah to the optimum? Productivity hacks. Um, I tend to be very mobile in what I'm doing, so I do most things through my phone. Um, I tend to also do a lot through talking with people. Um, I think people have different personality profiles and personality styles. So I tend to enjoy talking through something with a person in a coaching fashion. Um, to try and get to a conclusion and to ensure that they understand the direction and that we've agreed like the outcomes and when those outcomes are going to be delivered, you know, what it's going to cost or at least how we're going to get to a cost model or a statement of work. And then coming back and picking up on those things. Um, productivity hacks that I use, you know, with large team members, large numbers of team members is uh, I tend to go for fairly large spans of control. Um, so to me, you know, there's some thinking out there, and it's certainly in management theory, that you should stick to five to seven in terms of span of control inside of team. My view is that you should, you should probably go between 12 and 20. And the reason for that is the smaller your team, the more you're gonna get involved in working with them day in, day out on their projects, the more you're gonna poke your nose in, right? What is your role in this? What's the work that you should do and you should own? You're there to set the definition of the outcome. You're there to agree budgets. You're there to agree, you know, what are we going to measure around success for this? It's your job then to leave that process, let the person get on with it, let them form their teams, come back and help when, when needed. But you shouldn't be in the room solving the problems, doing the work for them, let them do the work. Even if you're better at it than they are, they need to learn to be better than you. So if you surround yourself with people who can grow to be better than you by having a large group of artists around you and then having a limited time with those people, that would be the hack that I'd use. You know, we use Google Docs extensively. Everyone has a one-on-one -on -one doc with me that we use as a scratch pad, a rolling scratch pad for stuff that needs speaking about. Then when we come together in our one-on-ones, our -on which are really religious in terms of like they happen every single week, um, we come together, we go through these things, we make decisions. People are empowered to take decisions as well. So if we go back, um, I believe you started your career as an apprentice. I did. Um, an apprentice as a programmer of mainframes. Yeah, it's really, I'm dating myself really badly now. So um, when I finished my A-levels at school, I did, I did maths, further maths, physics and chemistry. At, at school in the northwest of the UK. And I had a university place um, at Imperial College in London to do electronic engineering. 
And I also got, I was, I was a programmer. My side hustle while I was at school, I was a games programmer. Um, working for one of the games companies in Liverpool. Um, just kind of writing stuff to make a little bit of money on the side. Um, I then got offered a, an apprenticeship as a programmer um, and decided that I was going to go and do that, make a little bit of money, then go back to my university degree, get my bachelor's degree. So I signed up to be this, to this programming apprenticeship course as a mainframe programmer um, on System 370 assembler language and then was promoted subsequently to COBOL and DB2. It's really dating me now. Um, I loved it, absolutely loved being a programmer, being an engineer. Did that for a year, decided that electronic engineering wasn't for me, so reapplied to Warwick to do a computer science degree, um, carried on working. The Big Bang then hit the city of London. I then went freelance and set up a company and decided not to go to university and set up a business instead. I actually ended up working for financial services companies, implementing systems, project management, you know, that first wave of financial deregulation that happened. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't then go and do that bachelor's degree ever. I subsequently went back and did an MBA at Imperial, who were the first people ever to offer me a place. So like, I, I did go back there eventually um, in my 40s. Um, but yeah, I just went straight into the tech industry, loved it, loved every minute of it, loved the way that it works, you know and then moved from being an engineer through a variety of different stages into marketing leadership, which is a little bit of an interesting journey in itself. And the um, MBA that you took yeah. was with Imperial, and how long did that take? A couple of years? Two years. Two. So there's two types of MBA. One is a full-time MBA, which you typically do younger, um, which is full-time one year. The executive MBA is a two-year program, where you're with a much smaller cohort of much more experienced people. Um, and yeah, great experience. I'd really, I would encourage anybody who's looking to make a change in, in their career, kind of reboot in some way, find a new direction, um, to consider a program like that. It's a phenomenal, it's just a phenomenal journey of self-discovery. It's not about, you know, can you lead, learn to read a balance sheet? It's more around, can you learn to read yourself? and understand yourself and what you want to do. And for you, the main uh, cake-outs then were that, mm. learning about yourself, what it is you want to do, the period to reflect, um, look at macro business. Um, did you find that um, the network you built there was and has been useful also? Yeah, absolutely. So still in touch with a large proportion of the people there, still actively support Imperial in various kind of governance roles and on part of Imperial Council. Um, yeah, it's great. It's a, you know the alumni process there of your cohort and the broader cohort. It, it stays with you. You know, there's a lot of people there that you know. You know, it's amazing the people that actually you connect with in business that you did then know there at that school or who went to that school, and you've got something in common. And you are on the council with yeah. Imperial. Um, can you just explain to us what you're doing there? So all universities and business schools have a variety of different governance structures. So, you know, these are essentially advisory roles and governance roles that provide coaching, act as a critical friend to the different departments and the different leaders in there. Um, so, you know, if people are thinking about a potential non-exec career, in the future, it's a great way to start, to start to volunteer in an advisory way at a university or a business school um, and get onto one of those advisory boards, one of those governance boards. Um, yeah, would totally recommend it. Again, great way to network, phenomenal way to just connect with people that you wouldn't necessarily meet. There's lots of ways to, to, to network in that way and to connect with people. I'll tell you a funny story. So. My side hustle is I'm a scuba diving instructor. Okay. So I'm a paddy, paddy scuba diving instructor. Yeah, I know, it's a little weird. Um, it's very T-shaped. Um, I was actually in a lake before Christmas with a couple of people teaching them some deep diving skills in a place called Vobster out in Somerset. And so I'm in this lake and there's this guy, this Italian guy next to me. And we're waiting for two other people to get in and we're gonna go and do some deep diving skills in this quarry, this very cold quarry. Um, I say to this guy, so what do you do? He says, I work in FinTech. 
And the two of us are there in this lake looking at each other going, yeah, I work in fintech too, what do you do? It's like, I'm at MasterCard. I do fintech business development. I'm like, oh, I'm at funding options. Yeah, I know you, but what do you do there? I'm the CMO, so anyway. So, <laughs> so we then went on to have, have subsequent meetings and you know, conversations with those guys. But like anything you can do, if we're talking about career here, what can you do to reach out to people where you bump into people. Like it's amazing how many people are in London that you can connect with that will grow both your business, your career. And it's kind of, you know, always be hustling, always be talking to people, always be connecting. You know, if you connect with the same people all the time, things aren't going to change. If you keep finding ways to connect to new people, whether it's advisory roles, alumni roles, advising as a business, helping out at meetups, um, scuba diving, whatever it might happen to be, you know, you will find amazing things come from it. The world pays you back. In wonderful ways in that exactly. scenario. Um, let's say you haven't managed to get that working for you. So, what, the scuba diving or the Well, that, I, people, people <laughs> will come to you for that now, right? We'll put, yeah. we'll put a link at yeah. the bottom of this and uh, yeah. you'll, you'll get a, a surplus of applicants. Thank you. Um, going to events. Yeah meetups, the experience can be fantastic, mediocre or terrible. Correct. Do you have some good advice here, like in terms of how to seek out the right ones to go to? Um, you know, if your your new friend is working at MasterCard, of course he has this huge budget to yeah. go to every single event in his niche and probably has some type of sponsorship mm. or presence there. And perhaps it works for him or perhaps it doesn't, it's just a nice day out. Yeah. But if you're in a startup, if you're hustling, mm -hmm. if you're an individual who's looking to up their career, yeah. get into FinTech, then how do, you, how do you get productive with this? So keep talking to people, but be genuine. What I see with a lot of people um, who are trying to network, particularly people maybe earlier in their careers, the skill is a hard one to build and they can be a little bit too direct. So you know, if you can maintain humility, if you can listen to the people, if you can be genuine, if you can bring out like, what's inside you holistically? What's the genuine you rather than the transactional you? So at many of those events, you see people who are like, okay, I'm gonna speak like very quickly to everybody in this room <laughs> and figure out who the person is that's gonna give something to me that generally doesn't pay off well. People read that really quickly and they try and escape you. So how do you have like a short and effective conversation with somebody where you come across as genuine and caring and human and where you give a little bit of yourself, where you listen to them and understand them, where you ask intelligent questions, um, but then you move on. You don't get kind of stuck with that one person in the room for the entire day and become their best buddy. Um, that would be the skill that I'd encourage people to develop. That ability to kind of listen, be considerate, think, be intelligent in your questioning, think about the other person first, and not yours, not your own agenda and your own questions. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, it's a little bit like a set when a sales guy is trying to actually sell, I don't know, event sponsorship or something. Um, and that salesperson is coming to you and like, the only thing they want to know is, do you have a budget? Do you have a budget? No, I don't have a budget. Bye. I've gone. <laughs> um, take it. Take it slower. You know, smell the roses as you go. Kind of engage. Enjoy the conversation. Enjoy the dialogue. You know, use your body language to show that you're enjoying it. Yeah. So we um, have to, as headhunters, when we're training headhunters, understand that um, you know one of the best methods to ultimately build a relationship and build rapport is to get to know more about the other person, of course. Yeah, totally. and, and that's simple, but it can work really well or not so well based on if you're genuinely interested. Yeah. So the best headhunters in probably any profession is when they've aligned with their market. Mm. So if I were to go take someone who's really good at product and try and get them to be great at business development headhunting, it just might not connect. Yeah. So the whole point about you know, a business's North Star or a person's North Star or, you know, when you're searching for your mind or what is that, yeah. then, then the key is when you've broadly defined, okay, I want to be working in a startup, yeah. I'd like that to be in FinTech in London because it's super exciting. Mm -hmm. Then if you take yourself to those meetups, 
for those events, you just be, just be genuine. Just yeah. have just have conversations. Be interested in the other individual. Um, and if you do that frequently, good things are going to come from mm. that. Is some great advice. Yeah. And also, I mean, that applies to interviews as well. So, you know, you have a lot of people coming through for interviews. I'm sure you, as a headhunter, you probably see this as well. I certainly see this, all the, all the people that I interview, you know, in a fast growth company where we're hiring all the time. Um, people come in and they haven't thought about the basics of interaction, body language, stuff. They may well be capable to do what they do, but there's that fundamental human, like, do we want to work with this person? Is this person going to be net additive to the culture here? You know, they may be able to do this one particular thing. How do we look at that person's capabilities and their style and their culture in a non-biased way and assess, is that person going to be beneficial to be here? Because if you put the wrong group of people together, you know, it's like a dinner party with the wrong guests. It, you know, that doesn't go that well. So just helping people understand a little bit more around how they do that and how they show off their best side um, and how they be a little, bit, a little bit less kind of driven in the interview and a little bit more open to conversation. Yeah, exactly. When you get somebody um, who's a candidate and you align them with their correct mm. interview, um, then the advice that we give is very simple. It's, you know, of course, the basics is, you know, breathe before you go in and then just make sure that you, you, you have a really enjoyable time. You don't need to say anymore because what's going to come across is that person is super excited about that opportunity. And more often than not, if you need to give any critiques on anything around that, it's probably mm. the, not the right fit. Mm. Um, and as people get further in their career, they get better at this if they've moved around. Um, but when you've got a small business, this goes um, for myself or... Um, other SMEs. What I've seen is it's probably easier to quickly go across, to grow a culture if you hire the same type of individual. Let's let's say in a recruitment mm -hmm. business that is a technical recruitment business, right? If I go hire a bunch of grads from Warwick mm -hmm. who've studied humanities, so therefore they probably don't have many obvious career choices. Yes then that person's going to be grateful for this role. They're going to become a good salesperson over three years. They're a profitable asset for us. Mm -hmm. But what you then create is this one-dimensional culture. Yeah. So what we're doing, and I, I'm sure the best, best cultures out there are doing, is trying to make sure that we have a diversity of individual, but where we're all aligned on the same mission. That's, that's, that's the absolute key. But how do you do that? Right, because you've said, okay, we're looking for people to be incredibly intelligent, mm -hmm. sharp. We're looking for people who are gonna be a pleasure to work with. Mm -hmm. We're looking for them to be net additive. So um, in startup world, you've got this rule where, you know, the last heart should be upping the average of the caliber of individuals. Absolutely. And if you keep doing that, yeah. you're going in the right direction. What are the nuances that you and funding options are looking for mm -hmm. to make sure that they fit the culture but there's a diversity. Yeah. So I think there's a question here around what is diversity? And diversity can be taken in many different ways depending on how you view this. And it's, it, you know, it's a difficult area. People find it difficult to navigate. There's two sides to diversity that I would encourage any leadership team to kind of really focus on. I'd, I'd encourage them to focus simultaneously on these two sides. So there is the kind of quantitative side of, you know, do you have a diverse workforce in terms of gender, in terms of sexuality, in terms of kind of different ethnic backgrounds? You know, do you have a diverse set of people there? Are there a range of ages? Or do you have a bunch of kind of, you know, tech bros from Warwick doing exactly the same thing, you know, and you're just rolling the same people in all the time? So that first piece is more of the quantitative you know, the, the metrics around like, have we got a good diverse group of people? The other side of the coin in this kind of model as well is, do you actually have diversity of thought, diversity of background? Because actually we could hire a diverse profile of people from Warwick who've all studied humanities, but they've got diverse backgrounds, you know, we've got a good gender split, etc. You're not gonna get that diversity of thought and to create the best products and to go to market and talk to your customers the most effectively, you need a diversity of thought 
a diversity of ideas, a diversity of background. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems we have here in the UK today is we have these big bubbles. You know, London, here in Shoreditch, it's a very specific environment. It's a very specific type of person you're going to find here. You know, it would be amazing if we can create a world where we can engage more people from other parts of the country, where we can go and actually pull in different ideas, different ways of looking at things. You know, if you look at the lending that we do and the services we provide, we're providing them all across the country. We don't have great representation of a typical customer from across the, co the country in our business. So we try and reach out to them and talk to them and you know, understand them deeply and not market to ourselves market to those customers you know and ultimately what we would really love to do is to get representation of those particular people backgrounds cultures ways of thinking etc inside the organization so we can just naturally you know recognize those pieces so, so yeah it's tough it's a really really hard one tough when you're small generally speaking yeah. and trying to hire incredibly intelligent people with a technical skill set yep. to sometimes have in your culture someone who would understand who your consumer is. Some of the things that I've seen totally. in FinTech work well is where brands bring um, customers into their business via some type of um, option scheme yep. where they become co-founders. Yep. You know, there may well be a billion options, but it, it, it gets the individual to perhaps attend uh, various brainstorming sessions. So that's yeah. something that I've seen work really well. Or customer success programs yeah. where, where you actually, you know, you have ambassadors in, in, in your customer base who you treat well and support um, and they work with you. So in terms of um, the CMO role, um, how do we visually see that with your efforts and funding options in 2020? And by that I'm being crude, are we going to see Billboards? Are we gonna um, get content in publications? What could we see out there? So the question there, I think, this is probably interesting to anyone thinking of a career in marketing, is like, what is a CMO? So we've got this abstract, you know, three-letter acronym, Chief Marketing Officer. You know, what does a CMO really do? The CMO is the linchpin of the customer-facing function. So we're the advocate for the customer. We think about the customer every day. We think about how the customer thinks about us and our brand and how the customer engages with us. We also think about potentially the systems that sit around that. So, you know, inside of my function, we have marketing and operations. So we run both of them as a single function. I mean, that's typical as a scale up business. As we get bigger, we'll probably break them into an operations team with a COO and, you know, a marketing organization run by a CMO. But right now we bring those two together, more like a growth function. Um, so for anybody working in marketing, that chief marketing officer is really the person that is captaining the ship around how we talk to customers, how we engage them, the narrative we create, the brand we create, the stories we tell, how we bring people into our business. And one of the things that marketeers often do, which really doesn't do them any favors is they focus their life on how do I generate some leads because sales needs some leads and my job is to generate leads and throw them over the fence to sales that's not your job your job is to engage the customer and your job is to focus on how many of those customers convert all the way through to happy customers who will then advise their friends family you know, people that they know online to use your service and then you get that amazing word of mouth power coming back through. So to me, that's the marketing role. So what you will see from funding options in 2020 is you will see a whole range of different things going on from you know, programmatic digital advertising, you know, paid engagement, a lot of kind of education and knowledge, publishing that we're doing. So we're focusing very heavily on building out content, driving content for small businesses who really struggle to find like, okay, how do I do this thing as a small business? You know, where's my reference information? So we're starting to invest and build all of that stuff out. And we're moving, you know, clearly we keep looking at that 
flow of customers who want to do a specific thing, such as take out some form of unsecured loan or property loan or whatever it might be. But then also moving out into more broadly, how do we help those customers? How do we support them? How do we be their advocates? You know, how do we create the thing that's right for them? Um, and interesting side story for you. Um, when I arrived, um, we had a particular brand narrative around funding options. And the brand narrative was something that had gone in a little while before under previous leadership. So I went and started to talk to customers. You know, we, the, the teams that we have, we're talking to them every day. You know, we're very good at kind of connecting me. You know, we found customers who would talk. We had an interesting narrative was about helping the small walk tall. So when I spoke to customers and asked them about this, almost every single customer said that they didn't think of themselves as small. No one thinks of themselves as small, you know. Your team, I'm sure, don't think of, you don't think of yourselves as like, hey, I'm a small business. I've woken up today as a small business and I'm going to be small today. You know, you think of yourselves as, yeah, we're specialists. We hit a particular niche. We're independent. That's right. We're proud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you think of yourselves as small. Though. But the, that was the interesting insight that we got. We, we, we found that the customers didn't think of, of themselves as small. So what we did was we, 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 we started a process of unbranding. So typically businesses will rebrand. So they'll say, we don't like our brand right now and our brand narrative, what do we do? Let's rebrand. So what's the insight around rebranding for marketeers? Um, rebranding requires you to jump from one unknown state to another unknown state with no base data. Now, Sure, if you're Coca-Cola, it's really hard to unbrand. But if you're not Coca-Cola, what you can do is you can start to reduce and take off your branding and strip your brand down, almost down to the ground, and see what happens to your data. The amount of data you've got on certainly digital businesses, you know, bounce rate, traffic, engagement, how many form fills you get, conversion rates, you know, all the way through, the data is awesome. So you can slowly start to strip stuff off and take things off. And as we did that, we found our bounce rate reduced, our conversion rate increased. So actually the simpler we made our brand, the better the conversion rate, the more effective our paid spending became. And what we're doing right now is we're going through that process of just stripping right, right, right back down. So we get baseline data. So then when we rebrand in 2020, we can rebrand from a base set of data when we start to add things, and it's more like a brand evolution than a rebrand. When we do that, we can actually see, does this move the dial? When we add this stuff in, does it make it better or worse? When we change the narrative in this way, what does the data tell us? So again, it's coming back to that whole idea of, can you be data-driven and creative simultaneously, rather than just being you know, creative and saying, hey, Here's a cool creative thing we can do. I think we should do this. Yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. And it's um, it's true of the expression pivoting. Yeah. You have to keep a foot on the ground as you do it. Absolutely. And um, that's a really good example of doing that. You're yeah. still focused on your um, strategy or your mission and you're looking at something tactical and you can keep proceeding tactically or you can can obviously regress but you shouldn't automatically change everything because you wouldn't understand the data you're just in essence exactly. rebranding yeah so that's um, that's a really great piece of advice um, okay all right I feel like we've covered a lot of fantastic topics is we there have. anything else that, that, that you'd like to get across to the audience no I'm fantastic it's been a, a fantastic conversation thank you so much for your time thank you David great Cheers. Cheers.